Bodhidharma. Uh, and, and I have dates written down here because I don't even try to remember these dates. I used to remember other dates, but if I don't repeat them at least once a year, I forget them. Um, we, we estimate he died in 532, so this was a pretty long time ago. And what he said was really important uh, for the formation of Zen. Now, nobody really thinks that meditation didn't exist in China before Bodhidharma got there. But Bodhidharma was the arbitrary point that was picked later on to say, okay, this is when the Zen school started. Because people were moving in that direction. And there's some interesting experimenting that they did. And the one that I like, um, and um, I've never taken the time to look the story up again, but it's in the transmission of light literature. And this is something that Zen students sooner or later are going to encounter the transmission of light. And I call it the sayings and doings of the old masters. And so the transmission of light are all these stories about the Zen masters that are written down and, and for prosperity, and then students see them and go, well, what, what was he talking about? What was that all about? And then sometimes they end up using those as the focus of their meditation. You know, what did the guy mean when he said no? What did he mean when he shouted and... What did he mean when this and that? And very often, uh, particularly out of context, it doesn't make any sense. So, of course, Zen in America got the, the reputation of being the very paradoxical but kind of fun school because we have lots of stories that don't make any sense. And I think the reason people like them is even though they don't make any sense, something a few layers down in their mind realizes they do make sense. But you have to be in a special place for them to make sense. And um, a childlike mind helps. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because if you're real, real serious, the more serious you get, the less they'll make sense. And when Bodhidharma went and, and he uh, talked to the emperor, and he made this statement, No holiness, just emptiness. This was uh, this is a, a good place to draw the line in the sand, because Buddhism was had been around for quite a while by that time. Of course, it had been in India, and, and there's a strong notion of merit in India, a strong notion of karma, um, and there is with Buddhist this idea of karma, uh, transmigration. We're moving along, and we're moving along, and we're carrying all our baggage with us. And as we grow spiritually, we start to let some of that baggage go. But we just don't have this moment. We don't have the moment that we're acting in. We're still stuck with all this baggage we created in past lives. And there's not a whole lot we can do about it. And really, the Buddha's message can be looked at as there's nothing you can do about it. So it's time to stop worrying about it, and you can only worry about what you're doing now. And whether you change it or you don't change it, the, the karma in the past, you need to work on your cause and effect in this present time. So Bodhidharma comes along. He's got an emperor who uh, was a pretty good guy. He was very supportive. By this time in, in China, Buddhism was uh, starting to become a Chinese religion. Now, Buddhism always had the problem through the ages. And it, didn't, it, it still existed here that it was considered a foreign religion. And so that when there were specific temples the monks could stay at. They couldn't just go out and rent a house and have a temple. They couldn't go out and if they had a, um, a supporter who was willing to come up with the money um, you know, for a temple in his village or his province or his area of town, they couldn't just build it. They had to actually have government permission to do it, and the government regulated how many temples they were pretty strictly. So that the what Bodhidharma uh, came into was still a pretty restrictive system. And that makes it even more spectacular that he got up there and he basically thumbed his nose at the emperor and told him the truth. Because, you know, people in power don't ever want to hear the truth. If, if you just let them say what they believe, then you can parrot what they believe, and then you'll be comfortable. By the time that uh, uh, we're talking about Bodhidharma, they had temples. Now, I, this is, a, again, can be a confusing thing because you always think of temples and churches. There has to be some sort of sacrificial altar and, and you have a god that you have to appease. 
Well, the Confucians um, felt that heaven was populated by a number of gods, each one having an influence on different things. And that, that was kind of the native religion, and they incorporated it and made it official. So you go to a Confucian temple and you'll see big and little goddesses. But it, don't confuse it with what goes on in, in a Western religion. These guys were going to function with or without people building temples. But they, uh, the main focus in here was the idea that ancestors did not disappear when they died. And you know what? I haven't met anybody that thinks they, they do except a very bitter uh, atheist. All the Christians I've ever met think ancestors hang around, don't they? Well, yeah, they're all going to heaven, or they're in heaven. Sure, it is. Oh, you, oh, you, you still accept the idea that heaven is eight hundred and thirty-two billion light years away? Oh, okay. So you have Confucian, the Confucian thing, and people typically in the Confucian temples they would go. Uh, to remember their ancestors. Just like people go out to the graveyard on the anniversary of the death of a loved one. They would do the same thing, only they typically went to the Confucian temples. And they would talk to their ancestors. Of course, they have to be crazy, right? All you have to do is go Memorial Day to a, a, an American cemetery to find out that there's lots of crazy people. They sit there and they talk to their ancestors, and I know that you you got this idea that heaven's all that long, long away. So what are these crazy people doing when they go to the cemetery and they put down flowers and they take a seat and they say, Margaret, I want to tell you what's happened in the last year. June just had another baby and Bobby, he got the job in that business I told you about. What are they doing? It's pretty a normal human kind of thing. I, I wouldn't even try to argue that there's any logic to it or that anybody hears what they're saying, that's, uh, that's another day and another time. But the thing is, this is the normal human response. So uh, I'm, I'm always a little bit chagrined when Westerners look at what they call ancestor worship, and it's not worship, any more than leaving flowers and, and having a talk with your husband that died 10 years ago, and every year you go out to visit him at the gravesite. That's not worshiping. That's, to me, that's visiting. And by the way, Buddhists do the same thing because Buddhists cannot move through a country without gr- part of part of whatever's going on getting grafted on there. So there's a whole ancestor thing in Buddhism that any th- good Theravadan Buddhist will tell you has nothing to do with Buddhism, and it doesn't. But it does have to do with being a human being, yeah. And that is that on most Buddhist home shrines where they have a little little statue of the Buddha. And uh, perhaps a small vase with a flower in it, or a, a artificial flower, and a little candle, and a little incense burner. And they go in the morning, they ring a little bell, and maybe they do some meditate. Depending on the kind of kind of Buddhist they are, they might do 15 minutes of meditation, or they might do 15 minutes of chanting, or they might do both. On there will be little tablets, memorial tablets, remembering uh, their friends and family that have gone on. This is what human beings do. That's one of the things that makes us human beings. So uh, then we had Taoism. Taoism is is an interesting religion. The Chinese have always been interested in spiritual and physical culture. And to be a Taoist was to learn how to conquer the elements and how to live longer. And uh, see, they didn't, they didn't pray to heaven to live longer. Heaven didn't do that. Heaven was kind of a place where more highly developed beings were that might influence things, kind of like the Greeks. But um, they weren't going to let you live longer just because you were good. And the Chinese came up with the idea that if they could figure the secret out, they could live just about forever. If they ate the right food and they conducted themselves in a correct manner, and particularly if they breathed in a proper way. So there were, they, it, this really had a strong influence on the way they lived their everyday life. Everything from the food they ate to the way they had sex. Things were regulated with the idea that they could live longer. And by the time Buddhism came in there, there were Taoist priests and there were Taoist monks. 
And they had Taoist monasteries and Taoist temples. And, um, of course, one of the, the silly arguments is that, you know, Zen really is not Buddhism, it, it's Taoism. I mentioned that last time, and that, that's, a, that's a very silly thing. But there are, there are reasons why <laughs> someone just on the surface can make that argument. The Taoists wore black. Okay? They wore white and black, and their robes were black. Well, when Buddhism came into India, or I'm sorry, came out of India and it came into China, the monks all wore a robe like I had on this morning that was yellow or orange or maybe a reddish brown, and um, they really stood out. And the intention of the, of the robes originally with the Buddha was standing out. It's, some Americans at times have a problem, and it's, it's an ongoing thing, and I just... I'm very lucky. When we live out in the desert like this, we don't have to worry about being part of an ongoing city argument. But I, I still hear people talking about, well, this is America. That's nice. And we're different. And so why are we, why are we trying to look Japanese or why are we trying to look Korean? And, of course, that's not what's going on at all. Certainly, the everyday robes that are worn have been influenced by the country where that robe is worn because it's usually a modification of what's worn there. Otherwise, everybody would be wearing kind of the sari thing that that is worn in Theravadan country. See, they just, they took that mode of dress and never, ever changed it again. It's kind of like the Catholics, you know. There was a period of time in the Catholic Church where everybody on the street wore the collar we think of as a religious collar. Well, when they stopped wearing it, the Catholic priests just kept wearing it. And after time... You know, they've got all these pieces of clothing they have on, and they have become vestments, but in the beginning they were just everyday clothing. Well, what happened in China when the monks came in is the climate just is too unforgiving for somebody to be wandering around like they're in a semi-tropical climate. So they had to start wearing clothes. And the first thing they did is they put on pants and they put on shirts or jackets, and then they put the robe over the top of it. And the Chinese wore the robe I have on today is similar to what they wear. Today, the traditional Chinese will wear uh, a thing that kind of looks like the Western Cossack, and they wear pants under it. They wear clothes underneath the thing. It's, it's their equivalent of wearing a suit. So the Buddhists come in there, and they're wearing all this orange and yellow. Well, guess who got to wear the orange and yellow? The royalty. Yeah, the, the emperor. Uh, there were other colors like purple that they wore, but... But those colors, the average person was not allowed to wear them. And so the monks got away with wearing it. Well, by the time we get down to Bodhidharma, who's sitting there telling this guy, there is no merit. You haven't done anything to get any merit. Um, That was starting to change. And from Bodhidharma's time onward, Zen monks have worn dark colors. And Bodhidharma's kesa, the robe he wore over his shoulder, uh, all accounts say that it was blue-black kind of like navy blue. And uh, this was a stepping away from the royalty. And you find that the very the strong practitioners had now moved out in the country. They moved on the mountains where it was hard to get at. They were no longer living at the court. The monks that lived at court, well, they had a pretty nice life, <laughs> you know. Uh, there was, it was considered to be a great difference between those and the monks that lived in the monasteries and, and led a, a much more strict life and not as fancy. So Bodhidharma not only stands up to the emperor and says there is, there is no holiness, just emptiness. He dresses and walks and talks like that, and he goes off to a mountain range known as Shaolin Mountains. And there is a temple up in there, and he takes up residence a little ways away from the temple in a cave. Okay, and for nine years, he sits in this cave. Now, this is extraordinary in itself. He made this big, long trip. trip usually took a couple of years to get there. If you look on a map, you go, how in the world could this take a couple of years? That's why about half the boats were lost. I mean, these guys were out there in eggshells trying to make their way around. And he goes off, and he sits in this temple, and there's not a whole lot about what happened before he got there. But we know that this guy... Wei Ko came to see him. And we have a story. Okay? So we just put cut off arm and we'll say, throw it away. Because this is what it's all about. Can you throw it all away without worrying about getting it on back? 
And that's exactly what it is. If I let myself be vulnerable, won't I be hurt? You know, the, probably at, at first blush, when you look at it, if you had 10 people sitting in a zendo, they, are, they appear to be 10 of the most vulnerable people in the world. Because to truly do meditation is to let your guard down. If you still got your guard up, you're not doing it. You have to open yourself to the universe. So if we had 10 advanced, whatever that is, but experienced meditators that could simply sit and open themselves to the universe, that would have to be 10 of the most vulnerable people you'd ever see. And you got to throw all your guards away, all your, all your tricks you've learned, all your defenses you've learned, and they're all normal and they're all natural. we got to protect ourselves from that guy who's going get to get us. We've got to protect ourselves from that person that's going to say something mean. And you throw all that away. Well, that's what Waco did. Because he was in pretty bad shape. What if they didn't let him in? Then he definitely would have sat outside. And, and we'd have to figure out, did he freeze to death or did he bleed to death? <laughs> but he would probably have been dead. 